And as you probably notice on your agenda, this is our first session right after Tai Chi of the entire program this year. So welcome your all early birds. Um, as we sit here today, over 800 million people across the globe still lack access to electricity, while human demand for energy is set to rise by 30% over the next three decades. Yet even now, energy production and use, with electricity, industry, construction, transport, all included, is the largest source of global greenhouse gas emissions. And if we compare the numbers, in 2022, the global demand for coal increased by 1.2%, and first time in history, it surpassed 8 billion tons. Meanwhile, IEA predicted the renewable energy will replace coal as the world's largest source of electricity by the beginning of 2025. Why are we talking about the numbers here? Because what we see here is a mixed picture and a fast changing one. And the choices we make today on energy transition will shape our collective future. And how do we achieve that? We'll have a distinguished panel, highly capable uh, of guiding us and navigate this transition map. Uh, let me quickly introduce our panelists today and uh, remind for everyone we'll leave 15 minutes for Q&A, so take your time and think about your questions. First is a lady on my left-hand side, uh, Dr. <coughs> Sekai Irene Nzenza, uh, Minister of Industry and Commerce uh, from Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe has committed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40% by 2030, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And um, the gentleman in the middle is Mr. Xin Baoan, Executive Chairman of State Great. And State Great, and for those um, not based in China, is not only China's major supplier of electricity, but also the world's largest utility company. And Mr. Simon, sitting right across from me, uh, Simon O'Connor. Uh, CEO of SMV Netherlands Development Organizations. It's a non-profit international development organization working on food security, water, sanitation, and I'm sure you'll let us know more details in a minute. And most importantly, the access to affordable energy in low-income countries. And last but not least, Mr. Franklin Servan Schreiber, CEO of Transmutex. The, uh, a Swiss startup dedicated to using technology to reduce the stockpile of existing nuclear waste. So we'll get started. Let me start with uh, Dr. Nzenza. The transition to green is incredibly important and also is set up as a, one of the priorities for the Zimbabwe government. But there's still significant room of improvement in your energy transition speed. How to address that and what are the key hurdles? Please. <coughs> Thank you very much, Arlene. Uh, Lee, let me begin by uh, saying good morning to everyone and also to bring you greetings from Zimbabwe. And I've noted that there are people here who have been to Zimbabwe or lived in Zimbabwe. So I'll bring you greetings from the President, uh, His Excellency Dr. Mnangagwa. Uh, in Zimbabwe, we are going through a transformation. We have recently, uh, recently as in, uh, in the last, last uh, year or so, launched the National Development Strategy 1. And the focus is mainly to transform three key areas. Transformation in agriculture, moving on to agro-processing. Transformation in the area of manufacturing where we are focusing more specifically on value chains. Having realized Zimbabwe's natural resources, our major challenge, Lee, was to do with exporting raw materials. So the major transformation in Zimbabwe now is to process the natural resources locally. And we're also looking at mining. And within the mining sector, we're focusing on value addition. So in all these areas that I've mentioned, from mining to agriculture, as well as to manufacturing, what's absolutely key is energy and energy efficiency. And we've noted that there is a deficit here. So if you have deficit in energy, you cannot produce. <laughs> you cannot trade. So. What are we doing about it? I would like to just pause here for a while 
so that uh, for the next question, I can then discuss areas in which we can focus on increasing our energy resources. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll come back to you uh, shortly. And let me move on to uh, Mr. Xinbaoan. Um, stay great. Um, as China and the world's largest utility companies, stay grid in industry and people's lives should speed up the transformation to clean and affordable energy. How do you do that? Thank you, moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It gives me great pleasure to participate in today's session. As we all know, effectively, a step out to the challenge of climate change. The uh, transformation of energy is the key. Low carbon, clean, and uh, effective development is critical part. As the largest company in China, we are conducting our uh, obligation in energy transition, and we're building new type of electricity system in China. Uh, we've come up with action plans for the uh, reduction of carbon emission. And we've enhanced our investment into key projects, as well as uh, scientific research. And we've established new type uh, electricity system innovation alliance. And we are improving our capacity to absorb renewable energies. And we've uh, produced 33 ultra high uh, pressure uh, grid. And more than 4.4 million stations, uh, transmission stations for electricity. Fourthly, we're developing energy storage station, which can support new types uh, of energy uh, store, storing capacity. And we're facilitating the electrification of end users. As we all know, electricity is the uh, secondary energy, which is clean and effective. So we should raise uh, the mix of energy in the end user consumption. That is the key for our energy transition. So energy to replace oil, energy replace natural gas uh, are the key works we're doing. Now in China, electricity and end consumptions percentage has reached 37 percent. In the future, that uh, presentation will uh, climb up. As we all know, uh, there is cost to energy transition. On the one hand, uh, we must promote low carbon transition. Secondly, uh, it must be sustainable and affordable. So our key is to guarantee the production and uh, to make it steady and stable. Now, the average tariff of energy in China has been remaining at a relatively low level. Residential and agriculture use uh, remain at the lowest level. The safety operation of grid has been improved drastically. Our business environment in the world uh, ranks the top. So the uh, satisfaction degree and happiness of the end users have increased. Thank you. Help, helping us lay out the uh, outline of China's energy transition, some of the challenges, but also achievements. These are massive scale, what China is doing. But Simon, you've been working on things not just massive, but micro scale as well. Like Minister mentioned, you lived in Zimbabwe. So in your work through SMV, how do you see energy equ uh, equity among the developing countries? Yeah, th th thank you and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And First off, if I may, I'd just like to say what a great pleasure it is to be back here in Tianjin in, in China. I think we all know, we all recognize that the energy transition, the transition to cleaner energy, the climate crisis, these are global issues that need, yes, contextually tailored solutions, but global, global solutions. And to have that, you need collaboration, you need relationships, and of course, you need 
you need trust, which is why it's so, so important and why I'm so delighted to be here in China. Um, you know, to your, to your good question, um, it's not actually that micro, the issues that we're grappling with. You rightly said in your introduction there are 800 million people that still lack access to any form of electricity. I could add there are 2.4 billion people worldwide, 2.4 billion people who lack access to clean yeah. cooking. So these are you know, big, large-scale macro issues as well. Um, and to come up with the right kind of solutions, we need the right kind of partnerships with, yes, development actors, NGOs, civil society organizations, but vitally important as well, the private sector and governments at all sorts of different institutional levels. I think there are three things that we at SNV, so yes, we're a global development partner, three things that we really encourage a focus on. One is the importance of context and contextual understanding. I'll just give you a couple of examples. I um, worked for several years in South Sudan. Um, uh, I'd worked in Sudan previously, then went down into South Sudan in 2005 when the Comprehensive Peace Agreement was signed. The country was then formed as a fully-fledged independent country in 2011. Fast forward from 2011 to 2023, so 12 plus years, and only 7% of that country have access to electricity. In Mozambique, where my organization is working, 34% of the country now have access to electricity. And at SNV, we're working um, already on a large-scale initiative called Brillo with the British and Swedish government and a range of private sector partners to create access to solar household systems and solar mini grids for 1.3 million people. So in the grand scheme of the world, perhaps that doesn't sound that large, but in the context in Mozambique, it is enormously significant. But the point is all contexts are different from South Sudan with 7% access to electricity, 34% in Mozambique to many, many other geographies. So we have to understand context. Secondly, and relatedly, then we need to design solutions that are most appropriate to those contexts. In Mozambique, it wouldn't be appropriate for any organization to start setting up solar mini grids unless, and I believe you just, you just rightly highlighted, you've got your tariff structures in place if you've got a good understanding of your, your tariffs. In Ethiopia, we're working with the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet, so a large-scale energy initiative, to set up nine solar-powered mini-grids for irrigated agriculture. We can't possibly do that unless the tariffing structure around those mini-grids is set up. And then the third point is, relatedly again, the right financing forms, yeah? To have access to an improved cook stove in Mozambique, you need to spend about between seven to ten dollars, seven to ten US dollars. There are many, many people in Mozambique that do not have seven to ten dollars in their pockets. It may seem extraordinary to some of us in this room, don't have seven to ten dollars in their pockets to buy an improved cook stove in one go. So you need your pay-as-you-go models, you need your lending models, you need your financing structures at those micro levels to enable people, the extreme poor, in a country such as Mozambique, to start climbing that energy ladder. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a ladder that we're talking about here. We're not going to go from uh, the 7% access to electricity in South Sudan to 100% coverage on a full grid anytime soon. So we need to be thinking about that energy ladder and the steps we can take accelerated to scale that access to electricity. Thank you. Thank you. We'll come back to many of the points you mentioned here, but thanks for giving us a picture of how comprehensive this challenge is. It's not just um, <coughs> energy. There's also finance. There is also um, governance, everything coming together. Uh, let me move on to Franklin. Um, well, your company is only four years old, as you just told me. As a startup, 
uh, but you are in a very specific and interesting space, the nuclear space. Tell us what's the difference of the role of nuclear energy 10 years ago compared to today, or if we fast forward 10 years from now. Thank you, Lee, and thank you, everyone. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here talking about energy. <clears throat> we definitely need a world forum because we are together, and CO2 has no frontier, so it's really key. Um, why are we here is because we are a startup, but we are a spin-off from CERN. And uh, this is, uh, we are based on s solid scientific um, references. And the key thing to understand is that when we talk about electricity, electricity is just a transmission medium of primary energy. What is primary energy? It's coal burning, it's oil burning or gas burning, it's solar panel wind, but it's also nuclear. And nuclear is the fundamental energy of the universe. It is the most powerful primary energy we can find in the universe. So if we could master that, it would be key. And that is our mission. We are now in the uranium fuel cycle, which has amazing advantages, but also one key disadvantage for us, which is the nuclear waste, the long-lived nuclear waste, which is something that is difficult to imagine on a human scale because it's 300,000 years. Um, but there are other ways to do nuclear. Fusion is one, and what we like to, what we're working on, which is thorium fuel. Okay, it's very hard to make a change as fundamental as going from uranium to thorium because we have developed because of the military need <coughs> for plutonium for their bombs, we have developed the uranium fuel cycle. The costs are sunk, and therefore, we can do commercial operations. We have to start from scratch with thorium, and it's always much more difficult to motivate states uh, you know, to do something new when there is no war. Mm -hmm. uh, but so the war against CO2 is not clearly as motivating as uh, you know, a real war, unfortunately. Um, but that's, that's where we are. As an environmentalist who was fighting plastic pollution of the ocean before, I saw the destruction of the ocean firsthand. That's why I got into energy, because we're warming the ocean, we're acidification the ocean because of CO2. Therefore, I got passionate about this. And the only thing I saw that really enabled us to have massive clean energy was nuclear in Ontario, Canada, they went away from coal in 10 years because of nuclear and wind. In the United Arab Emirates, where they have all the sun and all the space in the world that they want for solar, they are already producing twice as much clean energy from nuclear as from solar. Okay, so I believe nuclear is going to be indispensable to clean up, to, to have clean energy, but also to give energy uh, availability, you know. We need, in, in all countries that are not nuclear yet, a way of making nuclear available which is non-proliferant, that means it has no use in military, okay, which will not make long-lived waste, and which will be safe and cheap because the fuel cycle for thorium, thorium is everywhere and there's plenty of it. So this is our, this is our focus. Uh, to make energy available everywhere and to make the energy transition possible at scale with nuclear. Thanks for sharing that, very exciting. And as promised, I'll come back to Minister, and just like Simon mentioned, solutions must be appropriate to the country context and reality. And you, you said you want to share with us what actions Zimbabwe are taking to uh, accelerating energy transition. Let me just uh, begin by an anecdote. <laughs> I, I was uh, born in a very small village. Uh, there was no electricity then. And at that time, I know my mother was using paraffin lamps. I don't know who still uses paraffin these days. But there are many places in Africa where we still use paraffin. And we were also using candles. And I went to school studying using candles. And for cooking, it was just firewood. So that means cutting down trees and also making fire every single time you make a meal. But what has changed in my little village, in my home state, 
we've got solar. That was a life transforming, especially in my own home village, but we haven't got enough of that yet. There's so many schools that are off the grid, so many clinics still off the grid. So what we're looking at is a transformation, uh, giving access to solar energy at a household level, at village level, at institutions and also at schools. But when we move now to, to business, what we're looking at is bringing in that technology that I just talked about, the solar energy. But our vision is to reduce carbon emissions by 30% by vision 2030. Now that requires a much larger goal, larger strategy. So from a regional perspective, uh, we are looking at partnership and collaboration within the region, the SADC region, with COMESA, and more importantly, now looking at the role of the Africa continental free trade area and how best we can, as Zimbabwe, be part of that regional integration. And um, also, not just the regional in integration, but looking at the role of the private sector in ensuring that there is access to reduction of carbon emissions. I must also mention that uh, Zimbabwe has had this long-term relationship with a number of Chinese companies, and also especially the, the Chinese government. And uh, we are focusing on looking at new investments that bring in new solutions to our energy crisis. And already we are seeing some very positive developments. Uh, at the moment we do have one of the largest iron and steel company in Zimbabwe. And they, um, they've only just started uh, introducing new methods and new ways of uh, bringing in uh, solar energy. And Going forward, part of our strategy is that any new investments must also look at how best to introduce new solutions to the use of um, reducing carbon emissions. Uh, I also just want to mention that we are in the stage of transition. And uh, this transitional stage can only continue to improve through collaboration and partnership and by focusing on the private sector-led growth. Thanks. Thank you. You mentioned collaboration quite a few times. Collaboration with the regional player, with the uh, international stakeholder, and also collaboration between the public and private. I want to bring that to uh, uh, Mr. Xing as well. How is China, from your angle, collaborating with key stakeholders internationally? In terms of lower climate change and to seek international cooperation, in your perspective, how China seeks regional collaboration with the stakeholders? And thank you very much for your questions. Just now, you mentioned the key issues in the energy transition. That is to ensure the power security and the security in supply and the reliable production. It is true, power-centered, electricity-centered. Um, the transition is very, very challenging. China, 1.4 billion. We have realized a household-based and village-based uh, power accessible. And in this development, we have uh, formed much experience through our, ex uh, our experience, through our practice. We want to seek collaboration and to uh, enjoy the result. On one hand, we develop green energy, and also we want to utilize more renewable energy, advocate green consumption, and also to promote carbon neutrality, we try to provide regional solution. In Brazil, invested and built and, um, and the plus minus 100 kilo, uh, uh, kilo voltage ultra high uh, 
high voltage transmission, and also we can have the clean power to the uh, hundreds kilometers away to the rail and some polo centers, injecting the green power to the regional development. Secondly, we have uh, the uh, connectivity of the power infrastructures, enhancing the connectivity in power with other countries and to uh, emphasize on the policy coordination to promote energy production, energy consumption, and internalization of the process. At present, together with 10 countries such as um, the uh, Mongolia and other countries, we have over uh, 10 cross-border transmission lines. The other thing I want to mention, we uh, have collaboration on the low carbon green technology with the digitalization and energy technologies in that integration. New tax and new facilities equipment keeps emerging together with the universities, institutions, international organizations. We want to enhance the fundamental research and uh, fundamental technologies collaboration with international partners, engage in the international standards formulation. The other one, international cooperation in the transition, for example, uh, the uh, uh, summer Davos and uh, winter Davos international uh, cooperation and a dialogue to reach consensus to uh, uh, work together. And we want to uh, leverage international uh, network of energy in uh, promote the energy transition and the low carbon development. We try to contribute our wisdom from the state co uh, from our state grid cooperation. Thank you very much. Uh, picture of the international collaborations. I want to bring that to Simon, you next. Throughout your work at the developing countries, how to balance at the same time the need for development and as soon as possible, and also the uh, necessity of energy transition. And like the previous two speakers mentioned, what kind of role the international collaboration plays in that? Great question. I think I'd just come back first of all to Minister Nzenza, what you said about um, you know, your story of par paraffin lamps. There was actually a former US president who talked about you know, that extraordinary moment around 100 years ago, going from the darkness to the light, the transformation of just having that basic access to lighting to enable reading in the evening, to enable some productive use of energy activity. So that, that transformation is um, it, 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 it is so extraordinary from darkness to light. Then you look at your improved cook stove transformations. Currently worldwide, about 3.2 million people, mostly women, are dying prematurely from respiratory illnesses from smoke inhalation. 3.2 million people, mostly women, annually. You look at your time savings. Imagine, ladies and gentlemen, an improved cook stove, the 50% time saving you can gain from an improved cook stove. So again, these, these may seem like micro things, micro initiatives, but they can be extraordinarily transformational. So what needs to, to happen? I, I, you know, I hugely embrace the terminology, the language from the Forum Center for Energy and Materials, you know, really highlighting this trans transition has to be sustainable, secure, and just. And for it to be just, for it to be all of those things, it has to be inclusive. It has to be inclusive. So how do we ensure this inclusive transition? One, we need to take a systems approach. And was just, just said in the examples of collaborations with Mongolia and many, many other countries, you know, energy is, um, is rarely just a national issue. It cuts across borders, and as Franklin, you rightly said, it's, of course, uh, a global issue as well. So we have to get the framing router right around a systems perspective, and it would be wrong for me, working for a global development partner, to think squarely within that global development framework or box. We have to build those collaborations with the private sector. Second, and government, governments, of course. Secondly, and as, as I said, tailor solutions to context, but particularly think about the most economically viable solutions. I think there are currently about 420 million people worldwide accessing solar mini grids, and the IEA would say that's the most viable economic model 
for those 420 million of the 800 million people still waiting to have access to electricity, solar mini grids offer a, a affordable, viable economic solution. Thirdly, in building those collaborations and particularly engaging with the private sector, or within the private sector, let's not forget that small and medium enterprise segment, which is by far and away the largest segment within the private sector that we need to be talking about, how we can stimulate the right types of financing. So at my organization, we're working on things called results-based financing, where we're incentivizing those small and medium enterprises to go those extra miles, to go to those more peripheral geographies in the countries where we're working and providing access to the products that are so needed in those geographies through creating additional payment mechanisms for them. And then lastly, I think, um, I think it's so important for us to think about the optimization element, the energy efficiency side of things, or what my good friend Roberto Bocca might talk about in terms of energy intensity. Energy intensity. I'll just give you one little example, because I guess part of my role here is to try and contextualize some of the conversations we're having. In Western Uganda, SNV, we're working with tea farmers. Yeah, fa fairly large scale. It's great, very productive tea, tea, tea farming country. But it's hugely energy efficient because you're needing to cut down a lot of wood to fuel the drying of that tea, which then goes from western Uganda over the border into Kenya, down into Mombasa where it gets sorted and then sent off around the world. Who knows, perhaps we're drinking tea here in Changjin from Western Uganda this morning. But the challenge is there to produce a more clean, energy efficient tea, so you don't have to cut down all those trees to dry that tea. You need to connect those tea plantations, those tea producers, to the grid to clean the forms of energy. And the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, to do that, ultimately, you need to pay a bit more money for your tea that you drink in places like The Hague, where I'm based. And to pay more money, or to be prepared to pay more money, you need to have your tracing sorted out so that you can trace your tea back to those more cleaner productions in countries and contexts such as Western Uganda. And that's one little example, but you could say the same for the textile or garment industry in Bangladesh, where I was the week before last, or in many, many more countries. So you need your tracing, and then you need your preparedness for us in those more affluent societies to pay more for the goods and services that we are consuming so that you enable that more rapid transition to cleaner energy in contexts such as Western Uganda. Well, that's, you, you've mentioned that it's financing, it's tech change, it's also the mind change, mindset change and uh, consumer behavior change. These are all coming together and finally you can have the energy transition that we are talking about. Uh, moving on to uh, Franklin, the, um, your nuclear energy project is quite ambitious, although it's young. And since we're talking about collaboration, how do you see we can leverage international collaboration in that specific area and partnerships to accelerate the deployment of advanced nuclear energy in the safe way you just described? Thank you. Collaboration is essential. First of all, energy is governments. It's very, the private sector works very much within the framework that the governments give it for energy. And nuclear is the summum of this. <laughs> we have security, safety, all kinds of issues. And nothing is going to happen without government and collaboration between government because it's expensive and ambitious. Why is a startup, uh, what is a startup doing there? A lot of people ask me, what is a startup doing there? Well, <clears throat> you have big collaboration, governmental collaboration, such as ITER, for example, for fusion and other big collaborations, and they work, but very slowly. Um, what we bring as a startup is, is speed and dynamism. I don't need to ask anybody for approval in order to go and meet somebody to make a, a collaboration agreement with a research lab here or there. So we have um, this, this concept, which is very much like CERN, 
where we have a core team of super talented people, and then we dispatch the work across the best labs and the best private companies in the world. So we do bring the world together. We think everybody's talent, this is such an extraordinary moment, an extraordinary uh, need for a new energy that we need to bring together the best talent in the world. And that's where the collaboration works. We have America, a lot of European countries together, and now we're reaching out to Asia uh, to bring the world together. The problem is nuclear is also weapons, and therefore there is a special sensi sensibility. But I feel the urgency is such that we will find a way to collaborate, even if there is this nuclear sensitive aspect to it. So that's, that's why a startup is here, uh, to bring the world together in a much more nimble and um, productive way. Thank you. And we do save time, as promised, uh, for uh, questions coming from the floor. And as people are thinking about your own questions, I'll throw one um, onto uh, the stage uh, first. We talk about the developing needs for many countries. How to avoid power crisis? That's the, in the mind of a lot of governments while you do the energy transition, especially to the affordability and sustainability. Who ought to take this first? Prime Minister? How to avoid power, power crisis? crisis. Um, Zimbabwe is now the second largest um, producer of lithium, uh, second to DRC. So we are looking at uh, how best to um, utilize the lithium into electric batteries. And uh, let me just say, we are actually looking for investments in, in that regard. Uh, secondly, we have uh, almost 365 days of sunlight in Zimbabwe. So we are best placed to utilize solar. So in that regard, we are looking at investments in solar parks. And I'm very interested to talk to any investors who might be here interested in establishing solar parks in Zimbabwe. That would be one of the key solutions. Mm -hmm. so one solution coming from investment. For energy transition, we believe the first key is to stick to the direction of clean and low carbon with the prerequisite to guarantee the delivery of energy to assure that uh, there is stable production and supply of energy. Secondly, we should enhance the safety and security of global value chain and industry chain, as well as the smoothness of these chains. Thirdly, we should uh, step up policy support to energy transition, stimulate entire society to participate in energy transition. Thank you. With that, um, we'll take questions from the floor. Please raise your hand and uh, quickly identify yourself, the lady first and the gentleman. Uh, I think my question is for Simbao and Simzo. Uh, so I use Chinese. Um, In your presentation, you said to guarantee the delivery of energy is the prerequisite. And you've mentioned uh, state grid's achievement in that. In China, uh, when we are improving our electrification, how do you interpret? the uh, situation in China uh, when we are faced with the uh, consumption increase of electricity. Uh, I'm from Jiemen News. I'm a journalist. Thank you for your question. Uh, as a matter of fact, to guarantee the delivery of energy is a task, although uh, there is increase of power uh, consumption. Looking at the uh, current status, we could guarantee the delivery of power uh, in China. But I want to touch upon a point uh, that is about climate change and fast economic development. There is drastic increase of power consumption in China. So. 
uh, in 2023. Overall, the delivery of power is controllable and could be satisfied, but in certain regions during peak hours, uh, there might be some small gaps. However, uh, we've optimized the uh, deployment of power uh, on our grids. We believe we have capacity to ensure power delivery, even during peak seasons and peak hours. So please rush assured. Thank you. Good morning. I am Juan Emilio Posada from a company called ISA, which is in electricity transmission in Latin America. And uh, we, we operate in most countries in Latin America. What we have seen connected to some of the subjects in this panel is that there are citizens who do not have access to electricity and they do get to see the power lines. And that is not a fair and just transition. So we invite any one of you to join us in a, in, a, in a campaign to innovate and research on how to sustainably provide electricity to anybody under our direct influence of transmission, sli transmission lines in Latin America and add to that data connectivity, since we usually have uh, fiber optics on top of the, of, of the transmission lines. So we, we are very much open to that type of collaboration globally. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. And do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think, I think there are, of course, many, many contexts where that is a, a lived reality for many people. Um, it goes to my, port, uh, my, my, my point uh, about the importance of understanding context. We need to understand why indeed that is the case, why are power lines going straight, straight, straight across uh, certain geographies? What are the barriers to connecting the people living in those geographies to the grid? Is it, is, is it uh, the obvious one of finance or is it, is it something different? And then when we better understood what those barriers are, we can come up with contextually relevant solutions to overcoming those, those barriers. I would say as well that we continue to be somewhat fragmented as a community working to address some of these issues. I think even within the sort of non-profit development actor side of things, we have work to do to better share information, relationships, and technical know-how and in doing so, we can go a long way to underwriting the risks or de-risking that development finance institute money that is so desperately needed. We're still not quite connecting enough the different parts of the ecosystem, as it were, so that we de-risk that financing which is, which is needed. Thank you. And the lady behind? Hanna and uh, I'm from the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, we were part of setting up the Global Energy Alliance of People and Planet that Simon just referenced. Um, I guess my question is that, you know, uh, for most of the developing countries, the challenge is really how do you balance economic growth with decarbonization? Um, energy transition is, is something which needs a lot of capacity building in the developing world because, you know, we're just assuming that the way energy access happen, energy transition happen, will happen the same way, certainly not. You know, even basic stuff around how do you write regulatory policies for energy transition, etc. There's a lot that needs to be done on the capacity side. On the other side, we're seeing there's a huge deficit when it comes to commitments around climate finance. Uh, so my question to the panel would be, you know, we've been going into COP after COP. You know, if you had your kind of uh, vision, what would be the two things that you really would want COP to deliver on this time? Because this is a real crisis. I mean, climate change is not knocking on our door, it's right here. And issues around energy transition need to be addressed right away. But with the capacity gaps, financing gaps, how can the Global South really be able to uh, be on a path of economic growth, which is absolutely critical? Thank you. Thank you for the question. We have a session on climate finance tomorrow afternoon. Uh, in collaboration with Tsai Xing as well, so welcome to that session. And who would want to comment on that? Probably start with the minister. 
I think Simon wanted to go oh, first. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 you go first. I just need to write down it. Okay, okay. okay. I'm so happy to go first. I'll be bring, and, and lovely to be in a, a room with you, Deepali, and thanks for the question. I think um, for, for me, you know, one massive point is the climate financing money, that famous 100 billion that we've been hearing about. It must be additional to the ODA monies. Yeah, it cannot be a substitution. It has to be new money. We're seeing huge pressures on official development assistance budgets in all sorts of countries. So we have to ensure we protect, preserve, and in fact even grow some of that official development assistance financing and then the climate money comes in, comes in on top. Secondly, we have to explore those opportunities for, for, for leapfrogging. Yeah, the transition needs to be secure, sustainable, and just slash inclusive, right? To do so, I'll give you an example. A country like Laos, 90%, 90 plus percent of Laos is, is, is on grid now, and the grid in Laos is relatively clean. It's largely hydro, right? So there can be opportunities to leapfrog in the clean cooking space to go rapidly towards making more available your electric cooking, your e-cooking technologies. So constantly being aware of and in fact encouraging or pushing towards those leapfrogging technologies has to be somewhere a part of the, the solution to this. Thank you. Minister. Minister, and Mr. Shin wants to add something? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, Minister. Not yet. I would like to look at this at two levels. Uh, firstly, just pick up on uh, Simon's point um, in terms of uh, tailored to, to context. Uh, so from a household village level, firstly is the, the awareness. Um, in Zimbabwe, for example, when we started talking about climate change, we struggled to find the right language because in our language we didn't have climate change. And, but we found a way of packaging it in such a way that people then understand what climate change is. So at that uh, household village level, we're looking at inclusiveness, which you just mentioned, but also looking at affordability, accessibility and affordability, and then that brings in the technology. Uh, and then the second point is to do with, uh, just to pick up on financing that you mentioned. That, that is indeed a challenge. Uh, Zimbabwe has been under sanctions for just over 20 years, and uh, we are now focusing on ensuring that we utilize the natural resources that we have, uh, looking for investments in many other areas within uh, the global context. So financing is really absolutely important, and that, again, coupled with the uh, partnership and collaboration. Fantastic. And as she mentioned, what will be the two items we, you wish to happen on the COP28? That's part of the question, what will be the two? Uh, and, and part of my answer was ensure that at COP28, the climate financing that is required yeah. is truly forthcoming yeah. on top of the official okay. development assistance allocations that are also necessary. And Minister, also to access to these carbon credits, mm -hmm. and uh, we actually haven't spoken about that yet. But I think there's a forum for that. But again, uh, within uh, the African context, we're looking at uh, reducing carbon emissions through carbon credits. Carbon credits. Right. Are the gentlemen over there for question? And then on this side, yeah. uh, a mic, please. I was speaking Chinese. I'm from Jinke Energy, and we are a major global uh, solar uh, panel and also PV solution providers. Just now, you talked about uh, economics uh, below, uh, behind the solar energy and the 90% lower price in China's energy supply, and uh, I mean the power supply uh, in uh, solar. And the uh, economic performance is a very important consideration has been addressed by lower price in the solar energy. And the 
other thing like countries like Zimbabwe and the other countries and the relevant regions, we, uh, we, we haven't mentioned stability of these countries, even economically stable, but without uh, the uh, stability of the country and the solution may not be uh, sustainable. Do we have some comments or solutions to that? So would you just unpack that a little bit for me? So basically he says the scale can bring down the cost. And solar is one case in point that the solar cost has brought down by 90% already because of the production. And now for companies like theirs, when they come to the new market, the worry is more about the stability, especially the political stability, um, whether they can invest and work over there. How do you address the stability and security of that? We've come uh, out of a difficult time in Zimbabwe. But I would like to say quite clearly and categorically that we are in a good place and that there is political stability in Zimbabwe. We are going towards elections and we expect them to be free and fair and that going forward, investment and the open for business mantra that the president continues to speak about will continue. And also just to add to that, we have increasingly uh, noted the number of investors coming into Zimbabwe, and not just from China, but also from Europe. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for take the last round of questions. I want to collect all the questions and then go around the table. So the gentleman over here, please bring a mic. Uh, Philippe Patron from Orano. Um, I just wanted to make a comment on the nuclear energy. Uh, I think that we have to emphasize that the nuclear energy allows recycling of energy and the spent fuel. And uh, it was to be said because it uh, allows to enter in kind of a circular economies. And I think this is, the only, can, this is the only energy that we can do that. Just to give an example, in France, you know, in France we do recycling since now uh, 40 years. 10% of the electricity that we consume in France is coming from recycled uh, fuel, spent fuel, that we call the MOX fuel. Actually, China as well uh, has adopted this, uh, this uh, policy for, uh, for uh, on the nuclear side to, uh, to, to recycle in the future the, the spent fuel. I think it, be, it, it was to be said. Thank you. And the gentleman behind, let me collect all the questions from the uh, audience. Yes, just a second. So um, I work for an environmental uh, NGO in, in China, and I have a question uh, to the, uh, the gentleman of the, the state grid uh, of China. Uh, so uh, China's uh, emissions are still uh, a very large share of the global uh, emissions and also uh, still slightly rising. Um, so my question to you is um, there's also been uh, quite a few uh, approvals of new coal-fired power plants uh, in China. So, so what do you think would be the, the best way uh, to accelerate the energy transition uh, in China, which is so critical for the world? Um, my understanding is that the state grid plays a very important role in, uh, in that. Thank you. And uh, the gentleman you're right in front. Okay. <coughs> and thank you very much. I'm from Big Hughes. I'm the, uh, a manager in China. We have been in China for 40, 50 years. My question goes to all the panelists here. If possible, would you please to share with us? And uh, by 2050, by 2060, what will your perspective of the energy mix, wind, the solar, or nuclear in the coming years down the way? And the 2050, 2060, what will be the energy mix? Thank you. Hi, my name is Baruch Halpert. I'm from uh, Electric Global Hydrogen Storage Company uh, in powder form. Uh, part of our dealings, we see all the time questions about microgrid and how the energy transition could be utilized to leapfrog, like you mentioned, Simon, uh, the old ways of uh, electricity transmissions lines. So do you see a path forward by microgrids utilizing solar and wind and expediting, uh, I would say, electricity all around in uh, the third world, 
like it was done in telecommunication in the 90s. Thank you. Thank you. So we got, sorry, we got <laughs> five questions already and five minutes left. But before we answer those questions, let me introduce the fifth speaker of us, uh, Roberto. So Roberto uh, Boca is leading the Center for Energy and Materials at the forum. He can uh, make a quick comment and we can start answering the questions as well. Thank you very much. So uh, a couple of comments actually. You asked earlier a question on how we avoid power crisis. I think it's important to look at the element that Simon mentioned, the energy intensity. The waste of energy that is happening is a big element. So if we can reduce the waste, so address the energy intensity, that is the best form of energy, the one that is not consumed. That will allow us being on the cooking stove or in the big, uh, in the big industrial system. I just wanted to mention one piece of work that we are doing that will be issued tomorrow, a, a report on the energy transition, tackling the energy triangle, as we call it. So the energy uh, system has to support the three dimension of sustainability, security, and equity has been discussed today in this panel. And tomorrow there will be the ranking of 120 countries, how they are doing vis-a-vis -vis of this transition. So I won't tell you much about the content because I'd like you to look at it tomorrow, but it's very interesting to see how the two countries that are represented here, both China and Zimbabwe, are really doing uh, a lot of good things. So thank you for giving the space. Thank you, thank you, Roberto. And let's come back to the question. Um, Neil Clear, and then on the emission to Xinjiang, to China. Um, that is about the emission in China in the energy transition. How could we accelerate the energy transition, especially uh, the utilization of the coal is rising? And I want everybody to have a quick comment on the energy mix you are seeing 2050. So start with probably nuclear. Thank you. Um, we've seen many COPs coming and going and we've broken record every year of CO2 emissions in the world. So we have to question if the world is organized in a way to truly combat um, CO2 production and to do the energy transition as best as we should. I definitely think nuclear is necessary and I think for the 2050 um, energy mix the director of the International Energy Agency states that we need to invent 50% of our energy is going to come from technologies that have yet to be deployed and invented. So this is also where we should focus. We shouldn't just say it's going to be the way it is today, just projected. We need to reinvent something completely new. That's where we are. Reinvent something. Simon? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. I think, I think Minigrids absolutely is the IIEA recognizes, um, and as I stated earlier, ha have to be a part of the solution here. I think going from your sort of solar household systems to your solar mini grids, you get an increased productive use of energy. You therefore start to generate an economic dividend as well, which enables that, 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 that climbing of the ladder. I do think, and we're seeing, of course, countries like Mozambique, there's now the regulatory environment starting to come into place so that you get your tariff structures and then your enabling of indeed that um, overall mini, mini, mini grid, grid structure. And, and GIAP, the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet, have been an important part of that. I do also think there was a question earlier about the operating in more uh, insecure or volatile environments still extremely fragmented. You look at the sort of supply chains and the battery, battery side in particular, there's work to do to think about how we aggregate some of those um, initiatives, form deeper collaborations, and in doing so, de-risk so that we can get more of those technologies into those more, more fragile places. So mini grids, yes, indeed, a big part of the solution. Thank you. Okay. And just now, talked about the uh, the power the coal based power coal based power utilization in China. It is true that in China the energy demand is growing. However, the GDP the um, the power consumption per GDP is going down dramatically, and which has been uh, stated in the government working report. At the same time. The coal-based power development in China, we advocate a clean and efficient development of it. 
we have certain restrictions imposed on the development of coal fire power, which is to provide room for renewable energies development and to provide absorption and support uh, function to renewables. We know that uh, there's still intermittency and instability nature attached to renewable energy. So we need fundamental uh, energy to support the development of renewables. That is why uh, we are developing clean coal uh, to support the development of uh, renewables. Thank you, Mr. Ching. About the energy mix 2030, well, 2050. In 2050, I would like to see a household that no longer uses firewood. <laughs> and uh, also to see a mix, possibly, of biogas and uh, using the latest technologies that would have been available by then through innovation and research and the use of uh, technology. And secondly, I would like to see a situation where at policy level, you have the private sector working very closely uh, with the government to find sustainable solutions to energy usage. Thank you. Well, we have to wrap up, but before we go, I want to insert a sense of urgency. Like Franklin mentioned, we're in a war, combating CO2 emission and combating global warming. So if you identify one most urgent action we need to take, on energy transition, what would that be? Be very brief. Start with Franklin. I think we need to find alternative to nuclear, uh, the way it is. I think complementary. Everything has to be on the table. We need renewable, and we need new energies also that we're going to develop. So investing in research and doing fundamental things. Everything on the table, investing in research. So mine would be to accelerate and scale locally-led solutions by providing the right forms of financing. Local solutions, right financing. I believe, firstly, we should develop renewables. And secondly, to build renewable internet, energy internet. Energy that's accessible and affordable to the majority of people. And also at industry level to have a stronger focus on use of solar. See, solar affordability and access. Gentlemen, thank our extraordinary panelists for the discussion this morning. <laughs>